It was a dark and stormy night. The kind that grips you with fright. Cause the raging wind is howling like a beast. And the rain pounds without cease. In the darkness I stood alone. With nothing but my thoughts to roam. As lightning flashed across the sky. Illuminating fears that I felt and I could not deny. In the middle of the storm's fierce might. I felt a stirring, an urge to take flight, escape the night, and leave behind what held me tight, and chase my dreams and win the fight. But the winds and rain clung hard to me, while I tried and tried to set myself free from the darkness, from the secrets, and from the unknown. Or could I make the storm my own? Was there a way to figure it out? Beyond a doubt, a way out. I looked about, but I couldn't see a way out. I couldn't break free, but then a light came looking for me. It was that light that set me free from the storm that roared inside of me. He was that light, a shining light, that light who brought me hope and helped me to ignite a fire that would burn so bright and make all right my dark and stormy night. Storylines. Write good things. Today we continue in our uh, series, It Was a Dark and Stormy Night. And we've been looking at the reality that we all experience dark moments in life, much like Jesus' disciples did when they went through the death of him on the cross. And these times of darkness... Uh, they, we experience them in various ways. Last week, uh, Pastor Brandt uh, looked at the darkness of loneliness and the importance of community in responding to the reality that sometimes we will, we will, we will exist and we will experience that loneliness and the family of God is vital to us living um, and beyond that in our lives. You know, I believe that the the family of God is one of the keys to living as overcomers in all areas of darkness that we experience. And we'll see that again today. Uh, we need each other, don't we, folks? Right? We need each other. And he has put us into the, the family of God for a reason. And so, you know, uh, Christian relationships, they are vital part to living in freedom, living as overcomers, and walking through times of, of suffering as we walk through the areas of darkness that we experience in life. Today, uh, we're going to look at another area uh, where we can experience dark moments in life, and that's when we experience the darkness uh, of disappointments in life. Has anybody been ever disappointed? Yes, we, of course we all have, right? We've all experienced life. In fact, that's the journey of life, is that there are multiple different times that we experience disappointments in our life. Like when someone got a promotion that you wanted, or a job that you were hoping for, or maybe when you've gone through a, 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 a breakup, or or. A, you don't get accepted to that in that program or that that that, that college uh, uh, op, choice of college that you wanted to go to, or you didn't make the team, that basketball team in high school that I didn't make. <laughs> you know, I, it was it was like I, I still remember that till today that disappointment there of, of when I tried out as a sophomore in high school and I was going to make the JV team, not the varsity. I was just going for JV, and then maybe I could build into varsity and. And, and then the guys, the guys in the school said, Mark, hey, go ahead and try out. We never cut. There's never enough guys to play ball. So I tried out. And the one year in the, I don't know, 100 years of the school, they decided to, to cut. And I was cut from the basketball team. It ruined my NBA career. It was so disappointing. And it was. It was a big disappointment in my, in my life. And, or, you know, maybe you're, your career path took a detour. And you're saying, well, I wasn't expecting that. 
that wasn't part of the plan in, that I had put forth. And that, and, uh, or maybe it's a choice you made and you rather, you, oh man, I wish sure I didn't choose to do that. Or maybe it's your, even your children made a choice and you think, boy, I wish they had not done that or made that choice. Or when you fill in the blank, right? We all have disappointments. We all experience them. Here's the thing. Disappointments come in all sizes and significance. See, you can be disappointed about a meal you order at a restaurant, right? But that should be a minor disappointment, okay? And if you're flipping out over a meal you got wrong, you got bigger issues, all right? But then there's the ones that really matter, right? There's the significant ones. There's those disappointments that they, they impact your, your, your life. And, and if, you don't, if you don't process them in a healthy, godly way, they can lead you into uh, discouragement. Then that, that can lead you into depression in your life. And that can lead you into a place that's, well, it's not a, a good place that's, that, that, you know, it's, it's not good mentally or spiritually in your life. And so disappointments, they, they come in all sizes and significance. But also disappointments come when, when uh, our expectations are not met. Any times uh, our hopes are not realized or our expectations and desires or, or even our dreams are not fulfilled, we feel disappointed, right? We all experience disappointment for, uh, for different reasons too. And, and uh, th- th- that, feel, now that, that feeling of disappointment, it, it, it's not a... It's not a sin, but here's the thing. How we handle it uh, is so, so very important. It's vital as we think through and process the disappointments that we experience in life. But then there's this third aspect of disappointments, and that is, I think, already implied in everything that I've already said, but disappointments is common to humanity. It's the reality of living in a, a sin-cursed world. And as God is about bringing about his kingdom one day, and we gotta re- sometimes you got to remind yourself, this is not heaven, right? That's yet to come. And so we experience the reality of, of this world that is, is on a course towards ultimately destruction one day and then be made new in the new heaven and the, and the new the new earth that one day God will bring about. And, but, and so we, we experience it. It's a common reality to humanity. And so this morning, uh, it makes it difficult to choose which biblical character to, to best illustrate it. Because if you look into the Word of God and you start to read through the Word of God, you begin to discover multiple people throughout the Word of God who experience disappointment. There's Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Hannah, and Elizabeth. They all, month after month, year after year, lived with the reality of, not, uh, of being childless. And, and in that time and culture and period, a, a, a woman, a mother, you know, a, a married woman to have a child was very vital to who she was. And they lived with that reality. But then there's, if you read, you just spend some time in the Old Testament, you'll find Job, right? Job and his suffering, he's living, he's, he's living a godly life, and, and, and all of a sudden his world crashes down, and God allowed that to happen in his life. From what, what we get to read that, the here as we look back to that, that record of his life and what took place. Then there's Joseph, his brothers. You know, he's persecuted his brother, sell him to slave traders. He goes down into Egypt. He's falsely accused. And, and, and you see it time and time again. Different characters within the word of God who experienced genuine disappointment. Disappointment in people. And you could say almost a, a disappointment with God in their life. Elijah was a prophet who expected, you know, that that uh, there would, you know, 
as he, he offered up a, a sacrifice to God and took on the 400 prophets of Baal. That, that, man, there, there would come this revival. God would move in a mighty way, but by the end of the day, the queen was looking for his head on a platter. Wanted to take him out. And when we, and here's the thing, when, when, you, when you go to the New Testament, you have many more people. You find that they live life. Because, see, we live in this world, and they lived in this same world where they live with disappointment. And so the person I like us to look at today is the Apostle Paul. And I invite you to open up your copy of the Word of God or your, your device to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. We're going to be looking into the life of Paul, just, uh, and, and we're going to focus in on, in particular, chapter 4, the, the final verses, as he kind of shares some personal moments in his life. But here, in 2 Timothy, it, Paul is at the end of his life, and he writes this letter to his apprentice, Timothy, as really kind of his final words. And as he writes 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul you, he's probably in his 60s, but his body, it bore the marks of much suffering because he had been called to a great work in establishing the church, to spreading the gospel, but that involved experiencing some very difficult things in his life. You see, at this point in his life, he had experienced beatings five times by 39 lashes. Uh, three times he was beaten by rods. Once he was stoned. Three times he was shipwrecked. And if you continue to read on in the passage where he describes this in 2 Corinthians 11, you'll read about him being robbed, all right? He, him living in various dangerous situations, having sleepless nights, going uh, hungry multiple times, being cold. And then on top of that, he says, I, I carry the burden of these churches that God has, has called me to start. And he carries the great concern for all these churches that he has started. And even though, you know, he would have been in his 60s, he, he most likely he probably looked like he was in his 70s and 80s. A worn out old man. And here's the thing. As Paul writes this second letter to Timothy, he is now in a, in a cold, damp prison in Rome. And it's about AD 67, and he's waiting, get this, he's waiting for his execution. He has gone to Rome, and, and the reality is he's going to be facing death because of his commitment to God and the message of Jesus Christ. And he's waiting his execution at the hands of this cruel leader and madman, Nero. And imagine, on top of all this that he's facing, as he waits for his execu execution, he hears, he hears of the struggles going on. There's struggles going on in the, in the churches that he's started. So here's Paul. He's, he, he, you know, he's existing, he's living in this anti-Christian and, and corrupt culture. And there's the weight of everything is coming down on his shoulders. Bishop Mule said in regards to this period of time in the history of the church, he said this, Humanly speaking, Christianity trembled on the verge of annihilation. And I'm sure Paul carried that concern in his heart. It was a fragile time for the church. We can imagine, we can imagine the struggle, can't you? Just get a little taste. And as, as, as you think through all that Paul was, had gone through, you can imagine the struggle in his heart as he, he's, in a sense, kind of gives these final words to Timothy, wondering if they would be his final words. Uh, and, uh, you, you, know, you, you know, if there's someone, if there was someone who had every right to be discouraged, it was Paul. Who would have blamed him, right? You know? If he said, hey, I've had enough. 
I, I've given this thing more than my fair share. I've given every bit of effort. I'm going to retire. <laughs> I'm done. I'm going to go winter in Florida, you know, and somewhere on the shores of Lake Michigan. Oh, no, no, if you do that, it's all right. All right. But you can, you can imagine there the struggle and the disappointment and the challenge. You will understand if, if he was bitter, pessimistic, discouraged, a discouraged old man, his hopes, his dreams. You ever have a death of a dream? Huh? Something you just dreamed and, well, it died. You had to let it go. I have. And I can imagine Paul here, is, he, he's struggling in, in that. And here's the thing. What does Paul do? Paul writes to Timothy this letter. And, and I just think, I want to just highlight, I want to quickly go through 2 Timothy, all right, through some different verses. Some of these verses are verses that are, as I was re rereading through it this past week, the whole, whole letter of 2 Timothy I was like, oh, yeah, I like that verse. Oh, I like that verse. Oh, I like that verse. Oh, I, I need that verse. Yep, I, that verse has got to go up on my wall. Oh, yep, I got to meditate on that verse. There's this verse after verse after verse. In fact, let me just read some of you. In fact, this week, I would encourage you to read, to meditate on, on this letter this coming week. But listen to what he writes to Timothy. Chapter 1, verse 6, he goes, For this reason, he goes to Timothy, I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give you a spirit of timidity, but a power, a spirit of power of love and something. But I quote that verse all the time to myself. Jump down to verse 11. And he says this, And this gospel I appointed as a herald, uh, I was appointed as a herald and apostle and a teacher. This is why I'm suffering as I am, he goes, hey, I recognize why I'm suffering. Yet, he goes this, and how many times have you quoted this one? I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day, that I've entrusted in my commitment to God, and he will guard it. If you jump down to chapter 2, verse 1, he goes, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and these things that that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will be qualified to teach others. And so he's giving instruction, hey, pass this on. He goes, then he goes, verse 3, endured hardships like a good soldier of Christ. And he talks about this aspect of, of being a good soldier. But then also uh, he goes on and he goes, similarly, uh, compete as an athlete, you'll see there. In, in, in verse 5, and then he goes on, and then he talks about being a farmer. So he gives these examples, and he's encouraging them to remain faithful. Jump down to verse 15 of chapter 2. He says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of God. A vital, again, a, a great verse to remind, hey, guard, I want to, I want to be, do my best to handle your word and to dig into it and correctly handle it. Jump down to verse 22 of chapter 2. He says, flee. Here's a practical one. Flee e evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You can just see, he keeps, he's, as he's writing this letter, if you jump down to chapter 3, he goes, but mark this. And this is kind of, he, he's giving them a warning. He's saying, hey, be aware. No, and it's, I would say it's a warning to us. But he goes, mark this. There will be terrible times there in chapter 3, verse 1. In the last days, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanders, without control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having every form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with these things or them. And boy, there's a verse to memorize, right? And then if you, it doesn't stop. There's so much in this final letter. And, uh, and he goes down to verse 12. He goes this. He goes, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Oh, that's right. There is an enemy out there. Don't forget that, Timothy. And so he encourages them on. And then if you go to verse 
uh, chapter 3, verse 16, he goes, hey, just remember the foundation to, to living faithful is understanding the word of God. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so we walk in holiness that we stand in so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And if you jump to chapter 4, he says, now, hey, keep preaching, preach the word. Be prepared in season, out of season, correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. And he goes this, he goes, again, he gives this warning. He goes, for time will come when men will not, will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they will, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itchy ears want to hear. Boy, it sounds kind of like the days we live in today, Right? And he's saying, hey, come on, press on. But then he says in verse 7, and he's kind of resigned to the reality. And he's kind of preparing that it doesn't look good. I'm in this prison. And it doesn't look good, Timothy. And then he says, hey, I fought the good fight of chapter 4. I have finished the race. And I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Talk about richness, right? Talk about words to empower us. And, and boy, again, I would encourage you to spend some time this week in, in 2 Timothy. Man, meditate on it. Review it. Maybe there's a verse you want to grab and you want to print out and put it up on your wall in your, in your place where you have your time alone with God, whatever that may be. But see, Timothy here, 2 Timothy, it's packed with so many great truths for living faithful in a corrupt world. Living faithful when we have are faced with disappointments of this world that we live in. There are, there are truths for living with power over fear and living with courage and, and not shame, and living as an overcomer in the face of hardships and godless days, for, for knowing how to thrive in difficult times and how to finish well, ultimately, as a follower of Jesus Christ. And again, again, Spend some time there. And so I, I encourage you, meditate on those things. Because there, there's so many biblical truths to grab a hold of in our life. Yet, and this is a big yet. Here's the thing. It's one thing to read it. Right? It's a whole nother thing to meditate on it. And, okay, Lord, let this be integrated into my, my thinking and my way and to constantly review it. It's even another thing to study it. And I would encourage you, if you're not in a study, to get into a Bible study or get into a small group where you can dig deeper in, 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 in that regards. And for me, it's even one, another thing to preach on it, Right? I have to admit, Monday, uh, we met as a staff. We Every Monday, we had a staff meeting, spend time just looking over the week and praying together and, and that. And Brent says, oh, yeah, hey, I need you to preach this Sunday. And I go, what? <laughs> and he goes, I, I need you to preach on disappointment. What? No. This is almost like too personal for me. Because, see, there comes the everyday life, right? There comes this, it's one thing to, you know, to, to read it, meditate it, study it, and preach on it. But, here's the big but, but the challenge comes when you try to live it out from day to day. Here's the thing. One day, you can be claiming the truth in, you know, the truth in your life. For God did not give me a, a, a spirit of a, a, a fear, but of Power, love, and a sound mind. And in fact, I've studied it so much. I know it's, it, it, or it's self-discipline. I know that that also means sound mind. That I would have clarity in my thinking. 
And I quote that verse over and over again. It's a regular one I go to. And you've been quoting it on one day, all right? And then the next day, you encounter some temptation or suffering or struggle. And and it's so hard sometimes, right? Because of the disappointments. And you'd be crying out to God as... I, I've had the past few, God, I'm struggling here. I don't know what to do with this, God. Ever been there? There's the everyday. The everyday of living out truth. And so these moments that I have left with you this morning, I like to look at the final verses of 2 Timothy chapter 4. It's starting with verse 9. And if you see in your Bible, it will say maybe closing remarks or personal remarks, personal concerns. The title says, it's like a lot of times preachers look at this passage and say, I don't know what to do with this. There's some comments here. And, you know, but I think if we take a moment here this morning in our closing time together, and and I'll I'll be quick here as I wrap up, but I want to leave you with a few things here. And that is that we get to, we, in these closing verses here, we get a glimpse into Paul, how Paul is dealing with the disappointments he faces and the reality that his life's coming to an end. And so I like to read them, and then I'd just like to give some closing thoughts here to maybe encourage you as you go out and you face the different, different dif- disappointments you have. So verse 9, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9, it says, Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, he's deserted me, disappointment, and has gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has also gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychius to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. And then he goes on, another disappointment, verse 14. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, and this is when he went before Nero the first time in the government there. He goes, at my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. Another disappointment. May not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And, he goes, and I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he says, Eratus stayed in Corinth. Oh, he says, greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Ornifersus. Eratus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Malaeus. Do your best to get here before winter. Ebulus greets you, and so do Prudence, Linus, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers. And then he says, verse 22, the Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. There is so much random going back and forth. But there are a few truths I think here I like to share you because I think we get a glimpse into his everyday, Paul's everyday, as he's striving to live out the great truths he just espoused throughout 2 Timothy to encourage Timothy to continue on and be faithful and face his disappointments. And the first thing I see here is this, is, is that you know, what we can gain from Paul as he, he shares his personal concerns with Timothy is this. you got to acknowledge the disappointments in life, but with truth and grace. Paul recognizes the disappointments of relationships and, and what he faced as his life was coming to an end. There was the reality of those who who didn't give support to continue the mission that God had called him and established in the church that he was committed to. And 
Here's the, here's the reality. In fact, Chris and I were just talking before the service a little bit about this. There's times when you've got to grieve your losses. you got to acknowledge them. you gotta, you got to grieve them and acknowledge them. And it's important, though, that you do it with grace and truth. If you look at some of the things he mentions here, the Roman Christians who were committed, they didn't show up. They didn't show up in the face of adversity. Uh, it was a tense time because Nero was torturing and killing Christians. And to testify in court on Paul's behalf, would it, well, it would have been kind of dangerous, if not deadly. And so at this preliminary hearing that he speaks of, no one stood with him. But Paul shows grace and is patient with their weaknesses. And he echoes the words of Jesus when he says there in verse 16, may it not be held against them. Then there was Alexander. He was, uh, I guess you could say, almost superficially committed. He jumped in, but, but in reality, he was opposed to the message. Obviously, he didn't have a transformed heart. And so Paul warns Timothy about Alexander, the metal worker, who had done much, him much hurt. But here's the thing that's important to understand here is that Paul, Paul's just stating a fact. He's not calling down a curse on him when he says, the Lord will repay him according to what he has done. He's in the Lord's hands. Uh, the, the fact is, and Paul knew it, the fact is God will judge the unrepentant. And he says, I hope he repents. I imagine his heart, he's praying, I hope he repents. But the fact is, he's being an adversary to the gospel. John Calvin, in his commentary, he points out that this was not a personal revenge that Paul led Paul to say these words, but rather it was his love for God's truth. See, there, there's the lifting of God's truth. Alexander opposed Paul's teaching, and Paul knew that such opposition uh, would be a damage to the church in that regard. But then there, he mentions there early on, verse 9, Demas. Now, if you study the name Demas... Uh, this particular name, um, he had deserted, this person had deserted for the cause, uh, cause of Christ for the world. He got enticed by the world, the things of the world. Boy, that, we all understand that, right? We understand the enticements of this world. But uh, for Paul, Demas was probably more of a disappointment than all the others. When, uh, he had, when Paul had written Philemon in verse 24, uh, uh, this was a few years before, Paul included Demas among his fellow workers. He was listed as, as one of the fellow workers. He had been a part of Paul's team. You'll see that in Colossians chapter 4. But now, now Demas had deserted him, and, and it says because of his love of the world. We don't know whether Demas uh, later came to his senses and like Peter, after his denials, repented and, and got back on track. But Paul acknowledges it. Here's the thing. Paul acknowledges his disappointment. And I think that's a vital part. And so acknowledge. I think we've got to take those things where, where we're, we are disappointed in life, and we've got to offer them up and say, okay, God, I, I don't know what to do with this. And my heart hurts here. And let the Holy Spirit begin to do his work in your heart. And guide your thoughts and lead you. The second thing I think we can see is to stay focused on God's purpose and, and call. When you reflect on where Paul is at, he's in that, you know, that being in prison, <laughs> you would think that, well, maybe it's time to slow down a little bit. You, you would think it would cause him to lose focus. But what do we find him doing? Uh, he is focused on Christ's mission to the very end. And he recognizes how his friends in Christ are a vital part to that. He says in verse 11, get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me, what? In ministry. You catch that? In ministry. Um, uh, it's like, Paul, uh, don't you ever quit? <laughs> and his response is, no. No, I don't. I'm not going to quit. In verse 13, Paul makes a request to Timothy. He asks, 
there and said, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with the carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Now, we don't know what these scrolls were, but many scholars think that the parchments, they were more valuable than ordinary um, paper scrolls. And so they were probably his copies of the Old Testament. And here's the amazing thing about this. He, he has just acknowledged that he is facing execution soon. Back in verse, verse 6, he says, the time has come for my departure. He's acknowledged that. Yet he wants Timothy to bring his tools, uh, to bring his books. Uh, he's committed to continuing to grow as a disciple of Jesus Christ to the very end. I'm not giving up the word of God. And so in verse 16, 17, when, when Paul shares about, you know, you know, about being uh, in that preliminary hearing where uh, none of the Roman Christians uh, were willing to stand with him, you know, if there's ever a time, then maybe uh, there a man ought to be, you know, thinking carefully about the words he says. It's when you're in that preliminary hearing, you know, before a judge. And yet, what does he do? He proclaims the gospel. In the Roman court. And he says this. All, that all the Gentiles might hear it. He continued to witness. So he's, he's staying focused. Focused on his purpose and call in the face of disappointment. But then thirdly, I think there's a third thing here. Is that he seeks out believing friends to support him. And that's, that's our call. The importance of seeking out believing friends to support you. Believing friends are vital. Again, we come back here now to what we started with, and that being the family of God, this body that you are part of, this is a vital part of you walking in faithfulness. And, 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 when, and when you have, have a commitment to God's mission and call, a commitment to serving together, a commitment to enduring together and finishing well together, God uses those relationships to help you live as an overcomer, to be faithful. See, Paul wasn't a, a, a lone ranger. These verses have name after name. Do you see the names? Name after name of individuals who worked together with Paul. In fact, he was still sending some of them out to different places to do ministry and to proclaim Jesus Christ and, and to encourage one another in the faith. He was committed to the cause of Christ, working together with many others. He's committed to those relationships. And see, that's what the church is all about, isn't it? church is all about. We are better able to be faithful in this world when we are a part of a body of committed believers who share life together, who endure together, who serve together, who uphold one another in living faithful and encourage one another to live faithful in our relationship with Jesus Christ. But then lastly, I think there's a last thing I'd like to share with you, and that is this. Let God's truth and grace strengthen you. Paul writes in verse 17, But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength. Whether the, you know, the Lord was actually there and he had a vision of the Lord or he just knew the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in that moment, um, we don't know. But Hebrews 13.5 says this, it reminds us, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And no matter how difficult your circumstances or your, your disappointment, if, you are, if, you are, your trust, if your trust is in the living Jesus Christ, his promise is sure, is this, surely I am with you always to the very end. So Paul, here's the thing. Paul was committed to the truth that Jesus was sovereign in his circumstance. And as unpleasant as they were, those circumstances, he believed, he believed that if the sovereign Lord had chosen to do so, he could easily have rescued him from that prison and given many more years of ministry. And Paul says in verse 18, look again at this verse, he says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil act and, I, and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Here's the thing. 
He's referring to the evil acts of wicked men, the reality that we have wicked men in this world. And that yet at the same time, God in his sovereignty will decide how best to deliver him. Whether it was to be in the present with earthly results or through death into a new heavenly reality. Paul said, I trust you no matter what, God. I'm giving my my disappointments to you. As it turned out, the Lord did not choose in Paul's case to deliver him from these evil acts. Although he did deliver Paul through them into eternity. And that's the hope we all have. Paul's final words are this. Lord, the Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. You know what's interesting is that the word your in the first half of that verse 22 is singular. He says, the Lord be with your spirit. He's, He's singularly talking to Timothy. And that. But when Paul writes, grace be with you, that you right there, it's plural. Why did he, why did he, if you, if you study the Greek, you, you realize, oh, that's, it's in the plural form, to you. And it's as though Paul fully expected others to come after him and to read this letter. And he wants all who come after him as followers of Jesus Christ to understand that God's grace is for us, every single one of us. He saved you by grace, and he wants you to walk daily by his grace. Here's the thing. Our salvation is only known through grace. You can't earn salvation. You simply receive it. And if you've never done that, boy, I would encourage you to come to that place of faith in Jesus Christ Admit that you are a sinner. This is what grace is all about. It's coming there. I can't do nothing about my sin. And admit that you are a sinner, but then believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay your debt of sin. And then, then when you by, by faith confess him as I'm, I'm making you my Lord and Savior, you receive the fullness of God's grace that is a gift to you. And so it saves you from the reality of, the, of where this world is heading and that you have a hope for eternity. And one day we will have an eternity that will be endless. Think about that fact. Where we'll spend it in perfection, in a perfect world. And we'll, we'll delight in a, in a worship that, will be, that we don't even comprehend or can understand. That's grace. We have that hope. But today, he calls us to living out that grace. And we've got to continue to live in his power in our life. And as you turn to him, as you rely on him, as you trust him, he empowers you by his grace to walk faithful, to face the disappointments that come in life. If he has saved you, By his grace, it is by his grace you will come through times of disappointment and finish well. The worship team's going to come now and they're going to close this out with a with a final song. And I invite you, maybe this is time where you've got to just maybe there's been some disappointments and and maybe you just need to meet with God. I encourage you to do that. But let's stand together as we sing this final song, as a a song of worship, being reminded of the reckless love of of God. I believe that's the song, right? You changed it. It's a different song. All right. But it'll be a good one. I love the worship here at Waterford. And maybe this is a time where you say, God, I got to live in your grace in my life. I'll be back in just a minute.